question? Absolutely. Yeah. Who has a question for me? I've got a question. Um, you mentioned um, fun is one of the main yes. resources you like to bring to the company. Can you explain why that's important and give a few like examples of how you've implemented it? Sure. I don't want to work anywhere where I'm not having fun. That's the first piece. I, I, I think personally, I need to um, represent something I truly believe in and I want my staff to truly believe in it. And I want, I find that if we're having fun as a team, there's a lot of uh, intangible value you get as an organization. So if we are a standard black and white, large bureaucratic machine, you are gonna find that everyone runs KPIs in, sol in silos and we tend not to work. I can assure you Lenovo is not a perfect machine, right? Um, we're pretty good. We're better than probably our competitors at the moment. When you look at the size of us and how we interact with each other, I think we do a much better job. And that's largely because of our social connections with each other. Lenovo is all about internal relationships. And it's not, uh, what I mean by that, I don't mean it's a political thing. I mean, you just need to know everybody to get stuff done. Because we just, we're growing so fast and our M&A culture, we're chunking on bits of organisations all the time. Right, so right now, Kong Meng is trying to sell a whole lot of system X's on applications and infrastructure that still sits in IBM, mm. right? And it's gonna take me 18 months to get off all that infrastructure in Asia Pacific. So he's gotta be able to understand what his system X guys want. They've gotta they've got be able to sort it out on the fly. There's not a form that tells you how to navigate IBM IT systems for breaks, right? They've just gotta work it out. And so, fun for me is, firstly, genuinely enjoying what you do. But number two, getting everybody out and actually enjoying each other and getting to know each other a lot more so that when you do have a crisis, you can pull everybody together and there's no formalized you know, formalized methodology to getting anything done. It's just, hey, I need you to work out how to get this done. Yep, I know you, we can get it done quickly. There's actually a lot of intangible benefits around fun. But the classic example for me, and I used this actually when I was talking to the, um, the India Southeast Asia team just before. Last week we had our Asia Pacific kickoff, and you heard Nick this morning talk about social media and digital being very important for us as an organisation. We went from Yang Ching all the way through the um, day, about three, three and a half hours worth of presentations, internal presentations on what we're doing as a company, our brand change, what I want to do from an Asia Pacific perspective, it all came out. Then after that, everybody went into groups of seven or eight people, completely mixed up. Danielle didn't get to go out and spend her time with six other people from ANZ. She was mixed up with people from Japan and India, wherever they came from. Everybody had to have a Twitter handle straight away. And we gave every group a Wi-Fi hub. They put it in a bag and we sent them out into Shibuya and they spent their time taking photos of themselves, eating ramen, having gyoza, taking photos of the new brand running across the four. Um, TVs that are in that big Shibuya crossing that was in Fast and Furious, and it's the most, one of the most populous, busiest intersections mm -hmm. in the world. It's three thousand translation as well, but is it? Yeah, that's right. Yeah, that's so it's three thousand people cross the road there every time the lights go red, right? Even on a Monday night, right? It's just crazy busy, and they're just taking photos in that space, and um, everyone had to do it, and it was just them having fun. They had two times during the evening they could turn up to a nightclub, just get refreshed, get a drink have some beer, you know, have a cocktail, get some food, and then get back out again and just do social media stuff. That sort of stuff I'm doing all the time. So the, the ANZ team did a very similar type strategy last Friday night around Sydney. And I think it's it's important for us as a team just to consistently be doing that. And it's uh, it's good fun. I think that, that fun culture is really important to me from a, not only everyone lining up and learning, but also just the, the intangible, informal, things we need to get done from a relationship perspective internally. Especially when you're growing fast and you've got a whole lot of apathy. So are you, are you seeing that translating to results then? Are you seeing I that? think so, yeah, I think so. Look, I mean, I'm only eight weeks in this job, I'll be honest with yeah. you, you know. So for me to, to, to breed success immediately is pretty hard to say. But I think longer term, I'll definitely have the success out of that. I think the, the, the team coming together, just firstly, everybody understanding. You heard Nick talk about us targeting millennials specifically this morning. and. I've got people in my NEC business in Japan who are 50 plus who have never really ever used the internet outside of looking up a movie schedule or something like that, right? They're not, they're just not digitally sound people. 
and yet last Monday they had to go on a group, set up a Twitter account, take photos of the signs, tweet it. You know, they were actually in a contest to get it done, mm -hmm. just so they could understand what you know, these millennials are actually doing, mm -hmm. so they could grasp what was really going on. And they all came back and just said, that was fantastic, right? You know, and so I think just the learning and the experience, I, I think I have to, I have to get the benefits from it. Lining everybody up is really important to me. Sure. Yeah. So people are your best assets, uh, really, in, the, in some, in, in to Absolutely. That. You, you got a much smaller version of my deck this morning. So, you know, when I had the four tenants, there was growth, efficiency, speed, and people. Mm -hmm. When I actually did the internal presentation at the kickoff last week, I actually went one slide into each one of those and what it meant. Mm -hmm. And people is really important. I think when you look at Asia Pacific historically, we've been very isolated as a team, and we, you know by by region, sub region, mm -hmm. and I've got to expand that. So you're going to see me transfer people all around Asia Pacific. So if there's someone in ANZ who's got the skills that could help us out in Japan, I'm going to move them there. Mm -hmm. And we're doing three hours in Jakarta in a couple of weeks just on people, just to look at how, how we manage our people, how we change our people, how we train our people, what do I do with my key talent, what overseas experience can we expose them to. That sort of thing I think is really important to us as a company. When you look at Asia Pacific overall, 15.7% share, but take Japan out for a second with 13.6. I've got a lot of growing to do in Asia Pacific and I think people is basically the yeah. foundation of why I get there, so, how I get there. It's not a company you where, where the grass will grow under your feet, eh? It's, uh, no, you've, you've got, got, got to move. move. Nibble. You've got to move. Yeah. I, you've got to be a dynamic company. When you look at um, the changes we've got, I think my leadership team are a great group of people, actually. Mm -hmm. They stay very calm in what I would classify as a very fast-moving environment. And I think uh, I'm eight weeks into the business and... I would suggest to you my boss, Gianfranco Lanti, who you'll see present on Thursday, and um, his offsider, Jerry Smith, the pressure from them from day one has not subsided. Like, straight away, we're, we're in the hot seat for growth. Mm -hmm. The company really looks upon us as a growth opportunity, yeah. and I think uh, it's warranted, right? It's warranted, we have to move fast. Mm -hmm. Presumably we have to choose carefully, though. I mean, somebody might be awesome in ANZ and give you great experience in Japan, but they might have a family, they might have kids. Absolutely. You might ruin their, their home <laughs> lives by ripping the father or the mother away. Yeah. It's not just, life's not just about the company. No, no, no. It's got to be about life. There's always choice. There's yeah. always choice. It, 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 what we do is we have a very formalised, um, what we call OHRP, Human Resource Planning Process. And on that, you get to tick a little box that says you're mobile. If you're mobile, I'll move you and the family if you're mobile, to Japan. If you're single and you've clicked mobile, you go wherever you want, hypothetically. But it's a it's it's a mutual agreement. I'm not like picking someone up and saying, you're going to Japan. It's got to be part of your career. It's got to be complementary to you and it's got to work for you both. Yeah. Otherwise, I won't work for the company. No, that's right. It's Because it's, if I put someone up into Japan and they're miserable, they're not going to perform well, right? They've got to be happy about what's going on with their career. Yeah. There's plenty of opportunity in Australia and New Zealand for key talent who want to stay there. It's just, if there's, if there's a gap from a skills perspective mm. in Japan that I can leverage, I want to leverage it. I really You'd do. Crazy not to. Yeah. Yeah. And if you look at my career, to be honest with you, I, my first real professional assignment was 97 in South Korea. And then I came back to Australia. Then I went up to Japan. I ran the internet business for, for Dell for two years, basically three years, right through the bubble, right through the, the boom. And then back out again. Then I was in... Hong Kong, Japan, I've been sort of all around Asia. I've been to Japan three times, South, uh, South Korea, Singapore, Hong Kong. And I think, uh, and Sydney obviously three or four times. I think for me, it was a great learning experience. Just having someone in an area where they're just challenged differently is, is really a great expansion of your skills level. And I think you've got to be able to do that to be a future executive. Mm -hmm. A lot of companies have like um, relationship building programs with like within the company, mm. but it can often feel like mandatory and like yeah. horrible. How do you make it feel organic and fun? Well, I think you've got to make it organic and fun. I, I, I think if I formalise a let's all get together and have a lunch and try and... I don't think that's what I'm talking about. I think every... Like in Japan, we've got a social committee called Wakwakai, which means sort of like an exciting group, sort of something, yeah. a group of excitement or something like that is the direct translation. The reality is they're really just taking people out to go drinking. <laughs> and um, and I think it's important. I don't think I don't underestimate it. I think you know when you look at some of the cultures in Asia, you know, getting out with your peers after work and having a drink and getting to know each other is really important. And I think 
when uh, you look at Asia Pacific, it's it's actually quite a consistency. Even like I I used to have obviously Japan and ANZ as my group. The ANZ and the Japanese people will go drinking all night long, not be able to talk to each other, and come home at four o'clock in the morning. They'll do it all day long. Matt especially, right? He's completely nuts with it. So I think the the reality is those guys will will just drink and have fun together and build good relationships. I I don't want to underestimate it. I think it's a it's a really valuable part of our culture, and I think. If you look at our heritage here in Beijing, it's very, very entrenched. Mm -hmm. Like it's, it's, it's consistent globally. It's consistent globally. <clears throat> you mentioned that your your boss was sort of putting the putting the heat, the pressure on you from day one about the growth. Absolutely. You mentioned that the growth is big opportunity for growth there. So yes. what, what what's what's number one then? How, how do you, how do you then capitalise on that and, and satisfy his his need to get that growth. Well, his, his job is to put pressure on me anyway. It doesn't matter what yeah. I do. I can, I can be number one tomorrow and he's still going to put pressure on me. Yeah. I, I think um, when you look at the, the four tenants I've got, growth is, is really an outcome of the other three. It's actually designed that way. Yeah. So growth is our number one priority, but really you can't get the growth without the other three. The very first one is efficiency. I, I think if you have a look at when we ran Asia Pacific as a combined unit two years ago and where it is today, the cost of the headquarters that I'm running right now is far and, far and away below where it was. Mm -hmm. So I think we've got to be a much more efficient machine in driving growth across the business. So Matt's delegation of authority and, and what he's authorised to actually approve and manage as a country head mm -hmm. is much higher today than it was two years ago. Mm -hmm. Just purely because I want the person who's closest to the customer being able to make the decisions they need to quickly. Mm -hmm. You find that when companies... Sorry, mate, you sort of talk about the like, supply chain, manufacturing, all that sort of stuff, and... Pricing, office, delegation, yeah. Yeah. you know, I don't care if it's from a pricing delegation to moving his office. Yeah, yeah it doesn't really matter. Yeah. He, he's just a lot more authorised sure. than he was two years ago. Yeah. I, I think he's got to be able to make speed, speedy decisions. When you look at... When, when companies get big, they automatically inject more people into the process. And I think it's a... It's a You've got to be allergic to that, actually. Mm -hmm. You've got to try and stop that. Because what you end up with is a process, there's 10 people in a process, of which all 10 could potentially say no, but none of them have the guts to say yes. Mm -hmm. right? And you've got to, so you've got to very quickly try and re-engineer your organisation. I'm very, very passionate about it. If you look at big companies, when you really big companies, one of the biggest issues they've got is they're slow at making decisions. And in my industry now, as you get consolidation, if you're slow at making decisions, you're gonna die. Mm -hmm. So if you're in a process where you're always saying yes, get out of the process. You're not bringing any value to the process. Just get out of it, just, mm -hmm. just get out of it. It's just wasting your time and everyone else's mm -hmm. in there. So if you're approving expenses, I don't know what the, what the process is. If you're approving expenses and you always just say yes, get out of it, it's ridiculous, mm -hmm. just jump out. So I, I really run that message to my team as often as possible. We've got to simplify our processes. Our process on approving expenses, for example, in ANZ two years ago would have been like three people. Now it's probably six people. Why? Why can't we go back to three people? It was okay three years ago, five years mm -hmm. ago. So I think we've got to just try and continually challenge ourselves to run the company like we're mm -hmm. a lot more dynamic. Is this decentralizing? It is a little bit, yeah. I think it is. I wouldn't say it's I wouldn't say it's decentralizing, I'd say it's just empowering. Mm -hmm. It's empowering the country leaders a lot more. So they're closer to the customer, they're making the right decisions, and then ultimately I've got a very lean headquarters at the centre that's just consolidating. Yeah. So just, just with regards to the, your speed of, of product delivery, you said that you'll be releasing smartphones, hero phones, twice a year, and in some markets four times yeah. a year. Right? Yeah. Now I contrast that with Apple, which has been very successful, essentially just refreshing their phones every two years. Yes. Right. So why wouldn't you, why wouldn't you follow their strategy, which has proven to be successful, why would, you go, why would you go to quarterly mm. or half yearly? Yeah, so uh, look, without going into a competitor's situation too much, if you have a look at their market share, actually they're very, very strong in mature markets, right? And the more affluent part of the market. They're very specific to a part of the market, actually. Remember that. Not number one in the world, right? They're sort of number two. But I think with our product range and where we are globally, we actually address, or we're hoping to address, a lot more of the global demand. So 
when you look at the market that I had up before just in Asia Pacific, there's sort of two players that are quite high. And then we're sort of in this group of people, there's like five or six different vendors down in the sub 7% market share space. We've got to break out of that in the next you know, year and a half, basically, as Dylan mentioned, to step up into a very clear number three and then go and challenge number two. And it's, it's, it's not because we don't see what they're doing. We have to address what they're doing at that top end, but a majority of the buyers in Asia Pacific are that, that product can't even touch the price cells. And, like and so somehow having a short product cycle addresses that? No, I, I think what Dylan was really saying is there's a lot of feedback that when you look at the business model, the business model for the Lenovo product range is changing. And as a result, we're going to be taking customer feedback a lot more from a social perspective on what they want. As a result, you're going to see rotation of products. I don't think you're going to see a whole lot of products that are only going to have a three-month life cycle. I don't think that's really what he's saying. We're going to be bringing forward, we're going to be launching products four times a year in some of those sub-markets, just because you're going to see the demand for that sort of technology change so rapidly in, in the, in the sub-segment, in that lower part of the market. Yeah, the mainstream part of the market is going to change dramatically. If you're a, an end user in India looking for a smartphone versus an end user in A and Z, it's very, very different. Very different. Really different, actually. They're the two parts of the market that are probably the most different. Why? Uh -huh. <coughs> you 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 often hear in uh, you know in sort of sporting circles that that a lot of teams say that look we're not we don't worry about what the opposition does we just concentrate on what we're going to do. Mm. Is that kind of how Lenovo's philosophy is too? Well, to? yeah, I think professional sporting teams don't get to ask the ball how it gets through the goal sort of thing or it gets a try. Mm -hmm. I think. I feel a little bit like that. I think we watch our competitors, but the reality is we need to listen to our customers a lot more. And by customers, I don't mean Harvey Normans or JB Hi-Fi's, I mean the actual end user. Yeah. And I think you're seeing a transformation as the company, of the company right now. <clears throat> really focused in on listening specifically to what the end users actually want. I mean, you also still have to be very careful though, because you know Samsung came out all guns blazing, we've got this new device that looks just like an iPhone pretty much. And, and yet the articles in the last week have come out saying, well, it's a flop. You know, customers are buying the S5 because they wanted the waterproof, they wanted the, they wanted the, the uh, removable battery, they wanted the micro SD, and they're listening too much to the reviewers. I suppose it's not really listening to the customers, you know? That's right. So you, so you still have to make decisions there. Just because the customer wants it doesn't mean it's a good thing. I mean, that's the antithesis of what Apple says. Apple says, well, we don't care what the customer wants because they don't know what they want yeah, until that's we right. show it to them. So, there's, so it's there's, a bit of a balance. I think there's, there's two components to it. You listen to the customer on what improvements they want to see from a usage model. So when you're looking at, you know, what do you actually want out of your smartphone? I want everything in it, but I want it for 200 bucks. That's what a customer's going to say, yeah, right? The real, it's not reality, unfortunately. But we can go and say to them, real time, OTA, so over the air updates onto our software or our componentry or the look and feel of the GUI, whatever it might be. They can say, if I, if I had a choice, I'd have the, this icon sitting in the top left hand corner. If a lot of people tell us that that's what they want, OTA, we can make the adjustment in a day and then suddenly everyone's smartphone looks that way, right? If that's what a majority of people want, mm -hmm. hypothetically, mm -hmm. right? From an actual R&D design perspective, we need to get into work groups, we need to listen to social media, and we need to understand exactly what they want going forward. Take it all into consideration when we do product design mm -hmm. and then ultimately deliver a product that we think is the right one for the market. So there's gonna be data, there's gonna be feedback, everything comes together and that's how you design it. And, and presumably some of these quarterly updates or you know, half yearly updates is simply just the pace of technological change. Absolutely. You know, there's newer, I mean, Android updates are so slow. I mean, you, you <laughs> almost want to have a quarterly update for, of a low-end phone so just, so, just so you can get the latest Android OS quickly. Yes, that's probably Or, you know, higher versions of, of RAM or, or faster processors, etc. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah I, I think as you look forward, Lenovo has a, a, an enormous breadth of products in the smartphone range right now mainly because it's addressing all parts, sub-segment parts of emerging markets around the world. I think you're going to see us consolidate, build a very mainstream product set. When I say mainstream, main product set. And then you're going to have very specialised product sets. So this one's a specialist in taking photos. This one's a specialist in battery life. This one's a specialist in... It's not that the battery life's bad in the photo taking one, it's just it's not a specialist in battery life. Because we're trying to address all of the niches that people have. So somebody who's an engineer with a mining company heading up to Broome to assess something, 
they might want a 24 hour battery life on their phone and rugged where everybody or ruggedness for example yeah. or but then you've got everybody else who wants just a photo and they're happy with sort of 18 months on their battery uh, 18 years hours on their battery life so it all depends on what they want. So I think that's where we're going to get feedback and understand what we want to go. Does Lenovo do a lot of stuff in with its, you know, creating its own battery chemistries like Apple? You know, really focusing on. I think in the supply chain, we've got verticalized, outsourced hubs that we do that with. I don't think we own anything. I'd have to check. But I don't know. The sure. Answer to it. I just don't know. I know we've made. We've got the Lenovo Fund right now, the Fund, which is basically investing in a lot of companies that have unique technologies that we leverage in our supply chain that we take an investment position in to ensure that, firstly, if the technology really go, goes great in the future, we can leverage it. But secondly, just so that we're investing in the right technology and we've got first option to it you know, in the supply chain. I think you see that happening a lot with us. Do you see regard your supply chain management as a key competitive advantage is trying to move into the smartphone business? I mean, what, what is your... Yeah, I think if I, if I look at the PC and server industry, P, certainly PC right now, I'd suggest yes it is. If you look at our system X business right now as we consolidate it a lot more with the PC business, it will be. I think the smartphone, we've been historically running a very different model, which is more coming into compliance now with the rest of Lenovo. So I think it, it will be. I think we're definitely best in class in PC and, and server. I think, you know, from a smartphone perspective, definitely we're going to get there. I think we've been pretty strongly focused on a couple of core markets on the Lenovo brand historically. And now we've got Motorola, you've got these two very separate entities running themselves. At the very top end, we're going to end up consolidating a lot of the supply chain. And I think that's where you'll end up seeing a much more superior. So does that mean, what does that mean to Intel, for instance? Like, do you start consolidating the... the Physical platform between Motorola and like the. I'm so sorry to interrupt. But I have to take Rod for when oh. the meeting, but I think we've got a session. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So we've Intel. Got session after this. I do have another session after this. Right, I've got to go. Right, okay, excuse me. <laughs> I, don't know. I didn't realise I was out. Sorry, guys. So um, let me just quickly answer that question while I'm walking. The, I, I don't think it's really a specific situation for Intel per se. Intel right now. We leverage them for a couple of platforms, not a lot of platforms yet. I think when you look at the supply chain in smartphone, it's very different to PC right now from a vendor perspective, but I'd say the theories are very similar. The theories are very similar. Yeah. Okay, I've got to go, guys. Thank Sorry. you. No worries, thank you. Thank you.